one of the things that I think is critical in this day and age in particular, as we move into a post-Christian society, is our ability to defend our faith using what I call the Mars Hill technique. And what this is, is the technique whereby we argue for the principles we believe in, but we do so coming from outside of scripture, which is difficult, all right, depending on what it is you're arguing. But brethren and sisters, young people, friends, we need to be able to speak the language of the people to whom we are giving the message. And in society today, we just do, society does not take the Bible as authority. And even for our own sakes, we need to be convinced in our own minds that scripture is indeed the truth. We need to work through that exercise. We need to convince ourselves beyond doubt that indeed this is the truth, that there is absolutely a God. And that even if we didn't have the Bible, which thank goodness we have, but even if we didn't have scripture, we'd be able to at least come to some of the come to the conclusions we will tonight and be able to sort of realize that there's more than just what we see with our eyes. So um, I'm interested in as well, developing that idea a little bit more, some of the different topics we can address where scripture speaks the truth. Um, and so we shouldn't be afraid of defending truth outside of scripture either. Uh, and we'll, we'll illustrate this a little bit as we go. So how does this all mesh together with raising kids? Well, we've, we've identified it with this why question, but the topic that I was given, interestingly, is raising children in a changing world. Now, the world is changing in many different ways. It's changing with the amount of technology that we have, the amount of wealth we have. Um, it's changed in the last year and a half in this pandemic. The world is changing all the time. Um, what I want to talk about this evening is the way in which it's changing from a cultural perspective. And to do this, I want to illustrate with an example or with the reality um, of this image. So what you see here is the reality that Western civilization or the culture in which we live in the West, so Europe, North America, a lot of South America, a lot of, well, the English speaking world and a lot of the Western world are built on two foundational pillars that at this moment in time are being, and for the last 50 plus years have been actively gutted out by our society and by our culture. Uh, and those two pillars are Judeo-Christian morality, i.e. the Bible, and Greek reasoning and logic. And by Greek reasoning and logic, I do not mean um, that, the, that the reasoning is somehow Grecian, but that the, the tradition of, of logical thinking and reasoning things through has its heritage in Athens, in Greece. And so these two pillars, the, the idea that the universe is logical, that things could be solved through science, through mathematics, uh, can be reduced or deduced by observation is your, your Greek uh, pillar. And then your morality is foundationally built on the Bible through either the Jewish tradition or, the, or predominantly the Christian tradition. And in our society, as I've mentioned, these, these two pillars, but in particular, the moral pillar has been um, absolutely gutted out um, by, our, by our culture and by our society. And this is having a profound effect on the culture in which we live and its effects are beginning to be felt. Now, the purpose of our class tonight is not to dive into all the ways in which society is collapsing, but to acknowledge that we're in this very unique time where Western civilization has had the Jenga blocks of Judeo-Christian morality slid out and the Greek reasoning and logic is also on its way out, but Western civilization is still sort of hovering in the air. It hasn't had time to sort of 
feel the effects of those pillars being shoved out from underneath them, at least not fully. We, uh, I, I use this analogy because what we are seeing in society today are rapid changes in moral standards. What was acceptable uh, or what was you know, off the table 25 years ago is on the table and fully celebrated today in rapid time largely due to the fact that there is no moral backbone for th the average citizen to push back against these ideas. They have no framework on which to argue their points. And it's rather fascinating to watch this, I would say, relatively large silent majority go along with a lot of different things that they kind of joke about or think is, or is weird or odd or, or even wrong, but they don't really have a way to articulate it because they're a product of their culture and they gave up on religion long ago. So our kids are growing up in this reality. And I think the gr one of the greatest things that we can do for our children in this reality is to identify and, and instill in them that there absolutely is an objective morality and that that objective morality is actually built upon the reality that there is a God. And those two things are gonna be the cornerstone of our discussion tonight as we sort of begin to put together the foundation of our faith. In reality, Judeo-Christian morality and Greek reasoning, our ability to reason things through and think logically, which we apply to, um, to our faith as well. We, we, we try our ideas and make sure they make sense. Those two things are the linchpins on which civilization, the West is built on. And um, what we're seeing in our society today is that morality is being completely redefined that the idea of God is completely removed. The idea that church and state should be separated is an, is an old idea. And slowly we've seen a, a march through civilization where because God has been removed from the public discourse, um, morality has begun to, to, to squirm and, and shift to something now where um, it's being redefined almost on a daily basis. And so we're gonna look at that uh, in some detail, how do we how do we set standards in a society where standards are constantly shifting? How do we establish morality and prove morality when our society around us is constantly um, progressing further and further down uh, certain certain pathways? So. I'm not really even gonna deal with those specific issues tonight because I really care about the foundation more so than these specific issues, which we can certainly talk about later. But interestingly, as much as we've abandoned Christianity and we've abandoned God as a society, we largely live in an atheistic, materialistic society. We'll deal with that in a moment. It's amazing how much, how many of the issues that we encounter are all framed in moral in a moral sense, right? So, um, and, and I'm just essentially setting the table here, but just look at this little word diagram. I just made this up myself with a couple, I, couple of words that came to mind. So if you turn on the news on any given night and you watch cable news or you watch um, CBC or any of these shows, every single story that hits the news is likely going to have something to do with one of those words. And if it's not, it's another bad word that has some moral overtone to it. So corruption, war, genocide, hatred, racism is huge right now. Lies, oppression, lust, greed, bigotry. These are all words, but they have a moral overtone to them. The reason that they're a problem in our society is because generally speaking as a society, we deem these things broadly to be bad. And um, usually the media's point is to sort of draw attention to them and have society do something about these things. And so it's fascinating that at, 
on one end, we have rejected God and we've rejected his set of morality, but we're still very much a people that operate in a moral framework. We, we haven't said that morality does not exist because we literally act every single day like it does. And there, we're going to come to this momentarily. There are philosophers that, you know, or, and, and um, atheists today that say, you know, morality is just sort of a, an illusion, but they themselves live their life in a way that comports with what we would consider to be societally accepted morality. They don't, you know, they wouldn't say cheating on their spouse is a, is a great thing to do, that lying is good. Now, granted, if you take it to the logical extreme, as we'll see, you, you're forced to agree with that. But we, we, ha we live in this paradox, essentially, is what I'm saying. We live in a paradox whereby we've gotten rid of God and the moral foundation of our society, yet we continue to exist and live and operate through a moral framework. Our, our lives are constantly faced with moral challenges and our world's morality is constantly shifting. If you follow any of these progressive trends, there are things that we would consider bad that are viewed as bad, but there are also things that we would view as bad that are viewed as good, all because we society now feels that they're good. So on what basis do we define morality and, and where is God in all of this? So that's the conundrum that society lives in. It's the oxymoron in which um, it exists. And, and hopefully tonight we'll illustrate um, the clarity of the reality of God. So one of the famous philosophers who recognized this fact in the 1800s was a man with a fabulous mustache named Friedrich Nietzsche. And he observed the following. He said, God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. Now, what he meant by that is that science and particularly the Enlightenment, so the period from about the early 1700s through to the late uh, 1800s, this period of scientific discovery, this period of, well, enlightenment, where man made a, a, basically a quantum leap forward in his understanding of the natural world and in, in his uh, standard of living and in how, how we treated one another as well. A lot of developments happened through that period. And what essentially happened is all these scientific discoveries took away the slots that people had pegged God into. So when we could figure out why the planets went around, you know, how the, the solar system worked, we realized that it wasn't God holding the, um, you know, the strings in the air or anything like that. Okay, well, okay, we don't need God for that. God doesn't create lightning. It's, it's a natural force, etc. The more that God was removed from the, the observable phenomena, the more that science began to think that there was no God at all, that what, what existed was purely material. Um, and Nietzsche is actually an interesting thinker on this because he actually follows these thoughts through to their logical conclusion. And we're going to quote him again in a moment, but this is the reality that thinkers realized is that, okay, science has basically killed God. And so God doesn't exist. And certainly, as I've mentioned in previous discussions, this idea of a God of the gap. So when we, you know, hundreds of years ago, when we couldn't explain something, we would just say, well, God did it. And that's true, but there's often a material explanation as well. God, of course, creating the forces that made those things happen. Um, and so we have this recognition that science has basically disproved God. God is no longer a necessary component to explain things. So therefore, he's not real. Um, the, or evidence for his existence, science is supposedly just cutting down consistently. Um, which led to 
this belief called materialism. Now, most of you think of materialism likely as the accumulation of stuff, which is actually consumerism. Um, so you'll often hear in an exhortation, you know, one of our problems as a society and even as a brotherhood is we suffer from materialism. Yes, generally though, that's consumerism. We consume things and we lust after things. Materialism as a theory is the idea that there is, that reality is comprised solely of matter, that all you are is literally the atoms that comprise you and the electrons that fire through your synapses in your brain. That's all it is. You're just a, a meat cake walking through space and time. Um, that's a pretty limiting view of the world. But if there is no God and evolution has created us from nothing, this is all there is because we cannot, science has no means by which to see things on sort of a metaphysical realm. By that, I mean the realm that one would observe God, for example. And so a lot of our society, as much as they will not fully admit it, live through this lens of materialism, that there is no God. We are the masters then of our own destiny, and we will decide for us what is good and what is bad, which is rather interesting. We're going to see that that in and of itself is a bit of a paradox. I want you to listen to this next quote, though. This is from Nietzsche as well. Um, and I think this further explains uh, the conclusion that he came to, which is when one gives up the Christian faith, one pulls the right to the Christian morality out from under one's feet. This morality is by no means self-evident. We'll come to what that means momentarily. And then he goes on to say, by breaking one main concept out of Christianity, and that concept is the faith in God, one breaks the whole. And then he goes on to say, nothing necessarily, or in, in the true meaning of this word, by necessity, remains in one's hands. So essentially, if you pull God out of the equation, Christianity crumbles into nothing, which is absolutely true, right? <laughs> if God does not exist, our faith is completely worthless. It's, it's meaningless. And, and he's spot on by, with this. And he's also correct in saying that if God does not exist, the Christian morality also has literally no, no hierarchy or no importance. It's just a list of ideas. And, and I think that is the critical realization is that if God does not exist, any God for that matter, there literally is no morality. And we're going to flesh that out in detail for you. Um, but I want to just follow that train of thought just one more step down the line, because there have been individuals and there continue to be individuals down through time who have definitely followed this through to its logical conclusion that I am the maker of my own morality. Nietzsche himself came up with the idea based on his observation that science had killed God and therefore this morality failed to have um, not relevance, but failed, failed to have any authority behind it. He came up with this idea um, basically in German uh, called the Superman. It's called the Ubermensch in German. And it's the idea that man would, would follow this evolutionary trajectory continuing to advance, to improve, and that there would arise these men, which would be great men. And, and he used examples like Julius Caesar and Napoleon as examples of these just truly great men who themselves could confer a morality that pe other people could follow, um, which is definitely the, the framework through which humanism works today, right? We are we are all super, we're all special. Um, it's your truth, it's my truth, it's my identity, it's your identity. 
Um, however, that clearly creates chaos because who's actually the superman or superwoman in that case? Uh, and ultimately nobody's super <laughs> if everyone's super. The, the amazing thing with that, um, that idea though, is it, cre it, it was glommed onto by crazy people like Adolf Hitler. Hitler literally thought he was one of these ubermensches, one of these supermen who would create a, a new order, a more sophisticated and a more prosperous humanity. He viewed what he was doing as a moral endeavor. He was advancing humanity uh, and was morally justified in what he did because God did not exist. So logically speaking, he was being true to his ideals and he was being true to his morality. He was the maker of his own morals. Now, with the exception of, you know, radicals in the Islamic world, most of the world today would look at the acts of, of Hitler and say, yeah, probably one of the worst people ever to live. But again, without a, an authority backing your morality, that's purely an opinion. And Hitler's far more authentic in that in his belief than most of the population who just feel something is right or something is wrong. And another one of these characters that followed this framework of thinking to its logical conclusion was a man named Marquis de Sade. And he famously quoted this, which is the idea of God is the sole wrong for which I cannot forgive mankind. And he viewed this idea of God as this, this burden that man had unnecessarily um, shackled upon himself. And this man lived his life in just the most perverse way possible by certainly by Judeo-Christian standards and certainly by uh, our own community standards. This is a man from, wh from where the term sadomasochism comes from. He literally abused um, people for his pleasure um, all his life. Um, so a hor horrible person who took pleasure in other people's suffering, but was following the logic of the reality which is if God does not exist, I exist for myself only. My pleasure is the only thing that matters in this life. Now, you will have atheists argue you that, oh, there's, you know, you got to think about social cohesion and blah, 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 blah. But at the root of, of it all, if there is no God, there is no morality. And you can follow whatever, um, whatever framework you want, because you're the master of your own destiny at that point. And, if, and you are just this piece of meat floating through time and space with a, with a timer that's going to run out. So enough talking about morbid characters and digging at the idea of no God, no morality. I think it's critical that we understand this because our society um, is not willing to have the adult conversation about this. You, you definitely see this in the philosophy space where people actually have to uh, reason through their ideas and really think about these deeper things. But in pop culture today, there's as much as we talk about all these moral issues, there's no conversation about the reality that if there is no God, there actually is no morality. So why should I care about your concern about whatever the issue is? Um, and how does it benefit me, you know, would, would generally be the human reaction. I want to take you to this concept, the concept of Israel, because God, well, I grew up in, in a Christadelphian home. I was taught right from birth about God, and I believed in God all my life, but the, the level of belief you have in God is not a straight line up. And I think anyone on this um, presentation listening would agree that your faith in God ebbs and flows through your life, right? You have moments of great doubt and you have moments of great faith. 
And sometimes those things happen close together and sometimes they're spread far apart. Um, if you talk to a Jew on the street and say, what does Israel mean? Most of them will say something like to wrestle with God. Now, we know from Genesis that God calls Jacob Israel, and, and the full meaning is he was a prince who wrestled with God. Um, but this idea of Israel being a wrestling with God, I think is really fascinating because as believers, we, we believe in something that we can't actually see. We can't definitively prove it. I can't open my closet door and show you God. Okay, here it is. You know, you have to believe there has to be a, a mental framework, an argument you've built that says, no, based on A, B, and C, there must be a God. And so what I want to help you do is help yourselves and your children go through that wrestling process. And if you've never wrestled with the logic of your own faith, I think it's incumbent that you do that because it will only strengthen your faith. Here's the thing. Those that are speaking from experience, when I challenge my faith, when I dig in, when I chew the ideas around, I come back with just a really deep appreciation of the reality or the truth of what's contained in God's word. And it's not just then because the Bible said it, and because this passage and this passage, but no, actually, this is the truth. This is observable in other facets as well, not just the pages of scripture. And so this is the process by which we want to sort of look at this issue. And I'm probably jumping around a little too much with my random ideas here, but um, I think that ties into the but why question, right? Is this idea of Israel is one that um, the name Israel is one that we we're going to look at. So let's let's look at morality as a case for God. Um, and again, please at the end, if you have questions, please speak up. So here is the big reveal, and I, we've already been building towards this. To prove God exists, you basically, you have, to, you have to recognize that there either is objective morality or there isn't. The existence of God hinges on one axiom. We'll come to what that means in a second. Objective morality. What I mean by objective morality is that it's a set standard. It doesn't move around. It, it is true today. It's true tomorrow. It's true on Mars. It's true on Jupiter. And it's true here on planet Earth. It's a good thought experiment. You know, if, if 20 of us got in a rocket ship and blasted to Mars and the science was so advanced, we got there in a week's time and we set up a new civilization on Mars, we build our houses and it was just us there. Would it be okay for me to steal from you? right? There's no laws on Mars that says I can't do that. Does morality apply on Mars? If, you know, is a good thought experiment. What are the limitations of the morality that our society still retains? So God, the, you can basically prove God through this idea that there is objective morality. There is right and there is wrong. Now you might say, well, Andrew, how are you gonna prove that there's objective morality? Um, well, I think the, the easiest way to do that is to say, well, you either accept that there is objective reality or ex objective reality and objective morality, or there is not. Those are your two options. There, it either is objective or there's no morality at all. Those are the two standards. And I, what I think is fascinating is the reality that we have the ability to perceive things on a moral plane. We have this internal mechanism that senses when things are fair or unfair, when you've been cheated 
or when you tell a lie. Now, I'm not trying to conflate these things with conscience, and I'm not even trying to conflate what we feel with being objective morality. Those are different things. What I'm saying is we have the ability to perceive things as moral or not, just like we have the ability to see light with our eyes and taste things with our tongue. We have this additional sensory capacity to experience the effects of morality, all right? Certainly in the world around us, there's all kinds of different ideas about morality and even characters like uh, Nietzsche, Hitler, and uh, Marquis de Sade who had varying degrees of um, depravity, Nietzsche not so much, but um, Hitler and Marquis de Sade certainly they were still operating along the sense of what they felt was moral through the rationale that they developed in their head. So we have this ability to sense that something is there. We have to decide, is that objective, as in real, as in there's an actual standard, or is it not? Um, good way to test this would be I mean, I've used this example before. If, if the Nazis had won World War II and all of Europe was Nazi Germany, would Nazism be right in Nazi Germany? Would it be correct morality? And, I, and most people would say, no, of course not. Nazism was horrific and it's morally depraved. Let's let's think about this from another perspective. When we talk about things on a moral plane, we talk about things in the sense of good and bad. We judge things to be good or bad. In fact, we even do this for things that we wouldn't even think of as moral, like that's a good dog, or that's a, like somebody gets a disease like cancer, we would say, oh, that's bad. Um, interesting analysis is, um, you know, the doctor, cancer kills human beings and that's bad, but a doctor that kills cancer is good, right? So that's a, that's a framework of morality that shows two things killing, but one good and one bad as an example. Anyway, I'm <laughs> going all over the place here. This idea of good and bad necessitates a standard of what goodness actually is. All right. You cannot have good, actual good, without a standard bearer for what that good actually is. All right. And that's what we're going to come to see as God. Um, so what is an axiom? I promised I'd explain that. An axiom is basically an unprovable or self-evident reality, um, which is basically like a Jenga piece that holds up the entire structure. All right. And axioms exist all over the place. And mathematics is one of those places. Mathematics as a theory falls apart without some axioms. One of those is on the screen. A plus B equals B plus A for every incidence where there's variables A and B. All right. So anytime you run A plus B equals, you're going to have an outcome that equals either A plus B or B plus A. Math has to have that internal logic um, component, that little chip built in so that the whole system, all the cogs and the wheels and the rest of mathematics work. Because if A plus B equaled anything other than B plus A, the whole structure of math would completely disintegrate um, for, for this purpose. So, in that same sense, objective morality, the existence of right and wrong, actual right and wrong, is the criteria which proves God. God is the axiom, and he's also, it's, it's kind of like a circular, uh, circular argument, but they, they both prop each other up, right? Without God, there's no objective morality, and without objective morality, there is no God. Um, there's a famous, I've presented this before, the moral argument for God. So 
believe it was almost two years ago now, we did a presentation, um, reasons to believe in God. And this was one of the philosophical reasons to believe in God is a well-known moral argument uh, case, which is A, or number one, without God, there is no objective moral values or no objective morality. Number two, there is objective morality, and therefore three, God therefore exists. Now that seems like almost too easy, right? Like <laughs> it's not even fair that that level of argument, but when you actually sit down and digest it, that is the reality of the situation. And you've just got to be, you have to be willing to live with the two outcomes. You have to analyze this for yourself and say, yeah, I think, you know, there, it, there is right and there is wrong or no, there absolutely isn't right and wrong. You, you have to make that decision for yourself. So that moral argument is one that necessitates, like I said, a, a standard bearer of goodness. And of course we know where this is going. Absolute good, and this is me just fleshing out this idea of absolute good. This is us getting to God and explaining our rationale. So absolute good cannot be inanimate. We can't find the standard of goodness carved on a mountaintop somewhere. I'll explain why in a second. We can't see it written in the sand somewhere. We can't find it at the bottom of the ocean. We can't find it written in, even in the stars. Absolute good must exist in a state of being good. Goodness is a state of being. Um, and to further animate my point, any time that we would find a standard that we were going to ascribe goodness to, let's say it was a set of moral values and we found them carved on some mountaintop, we would be ascribing goodness to them, making us God in that circumstances. So what was good really wasn't, wasn't the tablet. It was us deciding that this meets our criteria of what good should be, which is basically the morality we have today, which is foundationless. It's circular and it's shallow because it ultimately doesn't exist. It's not based on any authority. Goodness, on the other hand, must be animated. It must have capacity to exhibit the goodness um, for which it stands as a standard, all right? Which is why we, we reason that God is, necessi is necessary for moral values because God is on this side of the spectrum holding the signpost for good and everything you know, to the left or to the right, however I appear on your screen, is not objectively good. Because this is the standard over here. And that's the framework through which morality exists. And I just want to take you on a little journey um, through scripture, actually, because scripture goes out of its way to make this point. And one of the things that I love the most about Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, is the, the way in which he communicates to those around him, because he is always conveying more than what it seems his words are saying. All right. So we're, we're, we're going to be very familiar with all the references that I use, but I want you just to, to remember this example, this is in Luke 18. This is where the, the rich man comes to Jesus. And we actually read it on Sunday uh, out of the Mark account. You know, good master, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus turns in responding. He's, he goes out of his way to say, none is good, save one that is God. Now, what's Jesus doing here? Is he being a little show off? Is he, is he, what's he getting at? Jesus is making this foundational point. He's, he's creating the case for morality because what this man is asking him is a list of moral values. All right. 
what are the moral values that I must exhibit to live forever, right? Which is kind of the question of all humanity, right? Like, what's the key to this? How do we break free from this life and move on to something greater? And Jesus sets the stage right from the beginning. He says, uh-uh. I am not the standard of morality. None is good that you're ever going to see on this earth, save one that is God. So God is going to be the source from which we will derive our prescription on how to be good. Because the question to Jesus is, what good thing should I do to inherit eternal life? So again, we're well familiar with this, but this is scripture identifying something that we've established outside of scripture as true and as logically coherent, scripture is now affirming for us. See, that's, that's, now we're looking at this passage slightly different, which is kind of what we want to be doing. We want it to be opening our eyes. The next chapter, or the next verse we want to look at is this idea. Um, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, I'm not making emphasis here as much as I've highlighted the word sinned. I'm not really talking about our sinfulness per se right now, but we've come short of the glory of God. We have come short of his goodness, his standard of righteousness, um, which is all tied into his glory. And interestingly, in Greek, this word sinned literally means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. Um, I'm actually into archery myself, and I can tell you that when you're shooting a bow, you're trying to hit the mark, but you know, you you often come short. You you don't hit it exactly where you're trying to aim for. And this is the same concept that's being presented here. It's not um, it's easy just to read these words and be like, yeah, we're all wretched sinners. I think the exhortation out of this is, well, where are you aiming as you're, as you're drawing your bow? Because you can be aiming not in the direction of God at all, and you're definitely missing the mark. But even when we aim for that standard, that ultimate goodness, we still miss the mark. And that's because God is the ultimate standard of goodness. He is the, the objective foundation of all morality. And scripture is confirming this. So again, we've built this logical case outside of scripture. And sure enough, scriptures are affirming that that exact same concept. I want to read this quote from C.S. Lewis because I think he just has a really great way of (laughs) articulating concepts that are a little more complex. And in in his book, Mere Christianity, where he basically is trying to describe to build the case for Christianity, um, he takes the reader through this very argument. He starts with this idea that there is objective morality, that we feel slighted when we're cheated or, you know, and he builds all the way through. And this is one of the realizations that one comes to when you begin to consider this idea of an absolute goodness, a standard bearer of absolute goodness He says in this work, he says, if there does exist an absolute goodness, it must hate most of what we do, which is true, right? Because even even in the world today, people who do not ascribe to Judeo-Christian morality would not themselves even view themselves as perfect moral beings, right? We, we contradict ourselves on a daily basis, right? We say one thing and we do another all the time. We're so inconsistent. And so we ourselves know that, yeah, we're actually really not good. And if there's an absolute good, the reality is we, we really pale so greatly in comparison to that standard, right? And the reality is that goodness must hate what we do. And so there's a chasm between us, us, and God or goodness. So that creates a problem, right? How, (laughs) what do we do about that? And of course, that's the argument of scripture, right? How do we bridge that gap between goodness, which started in the beginning, and the state we find ourselves in now? 
couple other quotes that he 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 mentions, and I'm just going to read them just because they I in case I haven't framed what I'm saying perfectly or I've missed you on a couple of things. He, he has a couple of things about morality, and I just want to read them to you. He says, morality raises in a good many people's minds something that interferes, something that stops you from having a good time, right? We think of morals as like, oh, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. But he says, in reality, moral, moral rules are directions for running the human machine. So just remember that, right? God is basically saying through his, through his morality, this is the best way to operate. You will work best running on this software. He goes on to say in another passage, morality then seems to be concerned with three things. Firstly, with fair play and harmony between individuals. Secondly, with what might be called tidying up or harmonizing the things inside each individual. And thirdly, with the general purpose of human life as a whole, what man was made for. So that's sort of the realm of what morality is sort of dealing with. Um, and it's that third pin that modern morality just does not have an answer for. We live in a world full of purposeless people that are constantly navel gazing, wondering what their identity is, wondering what their purpose is. With a God, we can determine what our purpose is by, by starting there. Third quote and final quote, it says, if we are to think about morality, we must think of all three departments, relations between man and man, things inside each man, and relations between man and the power that made him. So again, that's the, the, the realm in which these moral implications take place, right? Between me and you, but between me and myself, and between me and God. Um, so just a couple of thoughts there, but ultimately this idea that if ultimate goodness exists, we fall so far short of that of that goodness, which creates another problem for us, which we can solve another day. But I want to, this will be the last quote that I touch on. We're just a little over time and I apologize, but you recall that when Jesus um, is making his new disciples and he's by the sea of Galilee, tells Peter, or tells the fishermen to, you know, cast their net on the other side that they've been fishing all night. And they haul in the fish and the net breaks and Simon Peter goes up to Jesus and he falls down before him and he says, depart from me for I am a sinful man. O Lord. And it's this reality that Peter recognized that standing before him was somebody who, who was objectively good. This was the son of God or certainly a far, far superior, whether he, he believed Jesus was the son of God at this moment or not. He saw in Jesus a level of righteousness that put him to shame. And he, he wants Jesus to go away because that is an, he's in an uncomfortable position, being who he is in front of one who is so good. And that's the reality that we alluded to before, right? This idea that if, if God is truly good, he truly dislikes a lot of what we do. And therefore, there is an, an enmity between our behavior and his goodness. And so there's a lot of reconciling that we need to come to in that part, this, this reckoning to God, this ultimate goodness um, and us and our state that we find ourselves in. And we need to figure the answer out to that. If what we've built up to this point is true, and I think you can logically argue them in a bulletproof fashion. I hopefully um, we've been fairly convincing this evening. Um, we've got problems then that we need to solve, which is how, how do we fix that chasm? And we'll get to that momentarily, but 
this reality is true. Like, just think about if Jesus showed up on your doorstep tonight and said, hey, um, Andrew, can I come into your house? I just, I just want to spend 20 minutes with you. Be, it'd be exciting, but it'd also be kind of terrifying, right? Because I know I'm not nearly as good as I, as I can be. Um, and even that isn't as good as Christ. So that, that's the, the reality of, of humanity. Um, C.S. Lewis, final quote from him, basically summarizes up the same idea. He says, God is the only comfort. He is also the supreme terror. The thing we most need and the thing we most want to hide from, right? It's that dichotomy, right? God is so good. We want, we want to flee corruption and evil and be with God, but also <laughs> we're so terrified of God because we're nothing like him in that regard. And this is borne out by Israel when they're on Mount, or when they're receiving the commands from God at Mount Sinai, right? They tell Moses like, no, no, this is too much for us. We can't do this. Um, because they, they, they are in the presence of almighty God. It wasn't just some fancy thunderstorm on a mountain. Like they were feeling the presence of God's goodness and that was making them extraordinarily uncomfortable. And so where do we go from here? Once we have that foundation that without God, there are no objective moral values, that good and evil cease to have meaning without a, an absolute goodness that must be alive, that must have agency, that must have capacity to be good and to exhibit goodness. And once we also realize that we're not good, where do we go from there? How do we build out from there? Well, that foundation I think is critical. And that's the foundation that I want to try to instill in my kids so that they can build, um, that they can lean back on that and have conviction when they're challenged. Because at the bottom of it all, they know that they, they will one day stand before Almighty God, and they will have to account for, for what they've done. And I think the following uh, ideas are really outgrowths of this initial discussion, right? So once we establish that there, there necessarily has to be a God for any of this moral framework, if we're to accept that, we then need to reconcile ourselves to him. That idea of atonement becomes critical. How are we reconciled back to God? What is our purpose even on this earth to begin with? What were we made for? Because that ties into morality as well. Um, goodness, and this was reasoned by the Greeks, goodness can be viewed as fulfilling the purpose for which you were made. A good pen is one that writes extraordinarily well, feels comfortable in the hand. That's almost like a moral judgment on the pen. But our purpose, we must have one if there is, again, an objective morality and if we have been created. And what is our destiny beyond that? So those are the, the challenges that scripture solves, I, I fundamentally believe, and hopefully I've given you some food for thought and, and maybe in the future we can tackle some of these other topics and use this method of reasoning to get there to prove that our belief in scripture is not just purely due to the fact that we grew up believing this or because our parents really wanted us to get baptized, but because it's actually true. The universe bears out this truth and without this truth, the universe devolves into chaos. So we'll leave it there. 